So I think it's about time to start the live event, the live event of actually victory in sales. So welcome to all of you and uh, welcome to one hour of inspiration. Uh, maybe not the truth, but at least inspiration that can give some benefit for all these conversations we have in our selling and, and the way we speak with our clients and the customers. So uh, we're going to be uh, a lot of people today and I know a lot of people is waiting to get in. That's fantastic. And uh, what is interesting here is also that when we have so many people, we can inspire each other. That means during the session today, I'll give you a couple of questions or you can even call them exercises. And I'll definitely recommend all of you to put these comments in the chat. So in that chat, I would really like that you put a lot of constructive comments. And I can also tell you one thing that we will immediately exclude those people trying to promote any kind of product there. My uh, partner, Mark and Bjorn, they will sit down here and these of you that don't understand the rules of being here, you'll get excluded immediately. And those of you uh, sharing valuable information and sharing uh, your inspiration for, uh, for all of us, you'll be uh, definitely beneficial, uh, rewarded, because uh, you'll get, uh, get more information and, and also get uh, more rewards here. That's because what we're going to speak about, victory in sales. The problem is the minute we talk about the word victory, somebody think it's about a loser and a winner. And this is not about a loser and a winner. It's about two winners. It's actually a double win. Sometimes it's even a triple win, meaning that it's good for the customer, it's good for the selling company, and it's good for the planet or the world. That means victory in sales is much more constructive and much more uh, dedicated to winning for both parties. A lot of salespeople unfortunately see victory in sales as I killed the customer, I got the order. And that is not the intention in winning in sales. Winning in a sales is for sure that both people feel this was beneficial. Today is also gonna be a little more, some of you have participated in my events before. A lot of time we've been speaking about structure, strategy, tactical tools. Today we're gonna to speak about the most, in some ways for me, it's the most exciting thing we can talk about, behavior. We're gonna talk about communication. We're going to talk about how I can influence people and what actually makes people being influenced by other people and how do we influence them in the right way? Because honestly, I've been working 25 years or even more training salespeople, developing salespeople. And I, I said to myself about 10, 15 years ago that I want to get rid of two things, lazy salespeople because laziness will never create any victory. And second part, what I call incompetent salespeople. And what I mean by incompetent here is, I mean people that don't really take it serious to play the game of selling. Give an example here. We, we completely dropped sales now. We go into sport. If you paid the ticket to see a football game or you paid the ticket to see a concert with a musician, would you then expect that these guys for sure had practiced they had a goal, they know what to do, and they wanted to give you the most amazing experience. Of course, that means if I let anybody in, in my room, and they're coming as a salesperson, and they're not prepared, they're not ready, they're not taking it seriously, I should exclude them immediately from having a meeting with me. Except that we don't agree in the end about an order. Maybe I choose a different supplier, but these people coming here, not being prepared, not being ready, not being trained, not being practiced, I would never ever do business with them. And I think that's what we as salespeople should see. The minute we enter a room, the minute we enter a conversation online, the minute we enter a conversation on the phone, it's all about one thing. Do I trust these people? And trust here is a very strange thing because that's actually the key word to what we're gonna speak about. We're gonna speak a lot about trust. And that's, that's a difficult thing to talk about because what is actually trust? I would like I could just define it and saying trust is this, but it's not. And the reason for not being just trust is that it's an emotional thing. It's a different size sometimes. Sometimes trust is built within a second. Sometimes it's turned down within a second. And I read a, I read a quote from uh, Warren Buffett, the famous investor and businessman. He's that trust is a little like the air we are breathing. When it's there, we don't really see it's there. 
when we met when it's not there we feel it immediately and that's the same with trust if i was going to do business with any of you i might not even consider if trust was there but if there is no trust or even mistrust i would definitely see it immediately and i'll probably stop that relationship that we're working cooperation i'll stop that immediately so here we're talking about trust and the reason i put it up here together with two brains if you don't see it's two brains i'm explaining it that is since trust is emotional then it's because it's between the two brains here we have the sales guy and here we have the customer and both of these people here they have brains and these brains yeah Normally I would ask people here, why do we actually have a brain? Somebody would say to me, that's because we can think. No, it's not. That's just something the brain can do. But unfortunately, sometimes it overthinks things and make it too complicated. So it's not actually the reason that we have a brain to think. That's just one of the things, the behaviors the brain can do. And sometimes it's not beneficial. There's only one reason that we have a brain. And that is that the brain is gonna help us to survive not survive physically hopefully not so much sometimes it has to but mostly it's going to help us to survive mentally that means i have the feeling that i actually am a success i'm connected to people i feel sure i feel safe and if i don't feel all this stuff i feel i don't survive so here we need as a salesman to understand when we meet somebody here building trust is understanding what's going on in the brain of the customer and the funny thing is, we would really like, we would really like that it was very easy and it was very logical and very rational. And you can say that the brain of the customer is divided into two steps here. I put this as the thinking part of the brain. And then I put the smaller part as the emotional part of the brain. And the problem is, first of all, that most of our decisions are not made by logical thinking they are made by emotional thinking that's why we do irrational things and that's why we sometimes don't change the supplier because we don't feel sure about it we feel insecure and it's easier to stay so that's why that's why that it's really interesting uh, to understand the brain and how to connect because it is the brain that we are connecting to and to build trust then we're back here. Trust is in an emotional size. Because if I ask you right now, and I said I would a couple of times ask some questions, uh, I'll give you some exercises. If you could put down in the chat box, please, what, what is the two, three, four, five things, the behavior of a sales guy that will build the strongest trust to you? If you were about to make a decision, you were about to buy a car, a house, and I think actually real estate agents, I just shut off a workshop uh, just before joining here. I was training one of the biggest uh, real estate agents in the world and, and, and real estate agency are, are really, they are handling a building. A building is a, a, a bunch of concrete and, and wood and whatever that's rational. And it has a size, 250 square meters or whatever. It has a size, but inside that building is living some human beings with emotional parts. And unfortunately, these real estate agents very often speak so much to the thinking brain. So just try to imagine what will help the sales guy to build trust to you. Because what I'm going to take you through in a short while is that we're going to put trust into a little more rational parameter. That means I'll give you some aspects of how you build trust and also why you're not always building enough trust. Because even I, somebody would say, Matt, you must build trust 100%. No, I should not do it. Because sometimes I do silly mistakes, even mistakes that I should have known of. But I can, of course, evaluate. So put down what makes, uh, and I know what's coming now, knowledge camp, speaking confidential, uh, that you can be transparent. And, and, and it's a good example, transparency. What is transparency? Because if it gets true transparent, I might, might get confused. I just worked with a big, big bank the other day. And, and when we try to make it very transparent, then, then the explanation of the solution gets complicated. And when it gets complicated, it isn't easy. And when it isn't easy, I feel it's not transparent. So that means what you're putting up now, sorry to say, you're putting up words. You're putting up words that can help you, but they all build on some emotions. 
And I'm not trying here to, to, to cheat you or, or kid you. And then somebody put up, build rapport. Yeah, sorry to say those who put up these words, that is the most obvious thing you're build, putting up here, building rapport, but how do we do it? That's the question here that we're gonna work with. So to build trust is, as I said before, we are building something that when it's there, we don't really feel it, but when it's lacking, we really feel it's missing. So how do we build trust? Let's try to see this. This has been studied so much. Of course, we put it on the other side now. Mistrust, don't think about that. But mistrust, of course, if I, if I, I build no trust at all, that's because I'm cheating, I'm lying, and all that stuff. Forget about that. What we're going to do now is we talk about what is the best way to build trust. And I'll put up four parameters here that are all a part of this. And then I'll go deeper into each of them to do some examples, some explanation of how you build trust. And then my recommendation to all of you, that is definitely to be conscious about what's building trust and be conscious about how you can improve because if one of you is thinking that I am totally finally developed in building trust, then I think you're more finished than you're developed. That I mean by that is you're more done. And that means the minute a sales guy are starting telling himself or anybody else that he's the perfect sales guy, that guy or these guys, they will be out of this business. That's why you see the most impressive people in the world, actors, uh, mus musicians, sports people, they are constantly improving. Also because when, when we build trust, something around us changes. That means sometimes we have to change a little about how we're building trust. But let's go into this. We will put up some parameters here. And as you can see, this is about uh, an algorithm or, or formula, how to build trust. The first step here is what is actually called credibility. Credibility is, I'll go into that a little later. Credibility is the first step here. How can we build credibility? I'll be very practical and give you some examples because obvious, no, of, none of you will say, I don't want to be uh, not credible. Uh, no, you are, of course you want to create credibility, but maybe we do mistakes without knowing it. That means we do mistakes in our credibility that could actually help us to build better credibility. Then we also have to build what is called reliability. And reliability is for sure, a little different because otherwise there was no reason for having two sessions here or oh, sorry two uh, two parts here credibility and reliability you could actually talk about one of them is the short term one is the long term some of them are in a meeting some of them are over the long run and um, then we go to the third part the third part here is intimacy intimacy meaning being present uh, creating the right emotion showing that I really like what I'm doing. And I think all of you know that when we when we go into this, uh, a lot of times you can be very credible and you can be very reliable, but if there's no emotional part feeling that that guy or that lady, they're really dedicated to what they're doing, you don't really trust them. Because if they don't trust themselves and if they don't trust their product, then I could actually imagine that they will not they will not even go with us. So here we have three first steps. I'll go into them a little later. And then what you can see here, we can maximize these. Try to imagine that you can put them on a scale from one to nine and nine is the best. We would like to put these as high as possible. This study here is done by, by Green and Meister. They've done an amazing study about how to build trust. This of course is done by salespeople, people negotiating, people selling complex or less complex products. But what is interesting here is, they put up these and said, if you can maximize these three, then it's pretty amazing. And then below, we have the denominator saying self-orientation. And this is one of the parts where what you see in the world right now is self-orientation. That's when I'm more important than you are. And for sure, if you're in the world of selling and you want to be known as building trust, uh, you can never ever be more important than the people you're communicating with. So we have to learn how to, to lower self-orientation. And a lot of us, we do some mistakes because we didn't do by, by, by 
by purpose or consciousness, we just did them because we didn't, we was not aware of doing this. So actually what we're doing here is we are having a situation where these four steps can help us to build more rapport, as somebody said, but even more than that, we can build trust. We can build trust in the brain of the customer because we follow this. What you also see is, I put different colors here, credibility and reliability. Let's start with these two stuff here. These two are very much known for being rational things. First of all, when you meet a sales guy, now we just totally forget about intimacy and self-orientation. Try to imagine, and we'll just put up here some examples. Try to imagine you invite somebody to come to your house and you invite them to come to sell something to you. Or you're even, you're even getting them to come to your company to sell something to your company. First of all, when they arrive, when they arrive talking about credibility, they are using wrong words. You don't understand them. You don't connect to them to the words. They are bringing bad stuff. They're bringing the wrong stuff. That means they're not prepared. They don't have an agenda. They don't talk about the timing in the meeting. They don't even come back to what they started to say. So what we're talking about here, if you want to build the rational trust, the rational trust, because it's an important part as well. What can you do to build more trust? And I'll go even deeper down to tools a little later. You can first of all start, what kind of words am I using? Are these words, words from the, from the, the world of the, the customer? That means, do I actually know what they're doing? That means use the right words, try to understand their situation. We're not even talking about your mood and you're being present here. We're talking about who can actually go down to see how can I be even closer to them by the words they're using? Also here, what you can do is you can use an agenda and even, even that you're working with private people, try to take any kind of structure or control of this, saying what I would like to do is I'd like to show you this and this and this. I'll give you one example. I had one day, I had somebody who was home to do some landscaping in my house. That guy, first of all, he came 10 minutes late without telling me. Everybody can be late, but try to imagine that he had put up a message for me or he even called me and said, Matt, I'm so sorry, I got stuck up here in the traffic, I'm a little late. That builds trust that he's actually coming back to me. Then he came to my house and he had no piece of paper. He took no notes. He didn't even summarize what we were talking about because now we are talking about what we can do here. Have an agenda, summarize what we are talking about. Write down, write down what is actually going on. That means if I see he's writing, I know he might be writing something different for what I am saying, but at least I get the feeling that he takes it seriously. I get the feeling that he's actually here for, for understanding because when he's finished me meeting with me, he has to go home and do a proposal. How should that guy be able to do a proposal with actually not measuring my garden without without writing down what I want. And in my opinion, the funny thing is, I can tell you a little about my way of seeing this here. First of all, customer here, we have two customers, my wife and me. My wife is afraid that if he makes a wrong proposal and we get to work with him, it will not end up the way she wants the garden to be. That means her trust is that she's afraid of the final product. For me, it's not even about the product, it's about the process, because I know when he sends a wrong proposal, I'm going to change it, I'm going to have more meetings, I'm going to waste my time. So for me, building trust here is that I'm afraid of wasting my time. And you see again, it's just like the air we're breathing. When trust is there, I don't even consider it. But it, when, when it's lacking, I start considering in my head, I'm going to spend time, I'm going to lose time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a wrong proposal. I'm gonna change it again. And my wife said, I, she see the final product, it's ending bad. So here we're talking about very simple things, words, agenda, summarize, write down what you're doing. And what we do here is we actually in, in a situation where a lot of us have a lot of words we are using here. And 
and sometimes we can, of course, we can develop the client to understand what, what kind of business we're in. And we also here, if we want to make it easy to understand, then use drawings, use pictures, show me, because we know that the brain here with all its senses, because the emotional brain is connected to all the senses and the brain is connected to the eyes, the ears, mouth, nose, and all the emotional senses we have. And that means if we can do that, then we will definitely have a situation where if I can speak to more senses, I can show figures. We can even draw this drawing together in the landscaping. And that's the same. I have some very professional bank people, as I've just mentioned for you, and some very professional people selling huge machines. These machines, so it's a big, big project. The funny thing is when they sit down and draw together with the client on a piece of paper with a pen, they get more trust because they do it together with the client. We are in this together. It's not me. Of course, when they do the final project, it should be uh, professional and it should be on a, a great layout and it should be calculated finally and all that stuff. But you see, the funny thing is, just like my wife and I react in the landscaping process, that's the same way your client are reacting when you meet them, even that you're selling bigger projects. They are afraid of not having the final product as they want to, or they are afraid of losing time, money in the process. So understand, there's no difference from being Matt's and her wife in the landscaping or being the decision maker as a CEO, CFO, whatever. It's the same, you're selling to human beings. So here we're just talking about, if I want to improve my credibility and reliability, I can work with my words, use the right words, explain them, make people understand them, use an agenda, summarize, just go back to what you spoke about. If you spoke with them on the phone, start saying, I could understand you're gonna do a pergola in your garden. Yeah, that's right. Let's go and see, where is the garden? That means what I feel here is, he actually understood my message from the WhatsApp. And I have here to, to, to give a lot of, uh, it's a little like I'm, I'm giving you a warning here because you all want to be so efficient. So a lot of the communication goes on WhatsApp. And honestly, the problem, the problem on WhatsApp is, it's a rational tool. You put emails, you put WhatsApp, you put it on Messenger, you put it on tools that are rational. And the problem is, when you do it so rational, you leave it to me to think about what I'm reading. You don't know any, anything about my emotional state. You write a message to me and you're happy, but I'm not happy. That means I read it, I read it through that filter of not being happy. So if you want to control more of this, sometimes take it offline and not just do the simple and unpersonal thing, writing in WhatsApp, Messenger, email or whatever. That's a great tool. It's a great tool for efficient communication when you are connected. And the minute you arrive there with the client, start connecting on the emotional state. And you can do that easily if you talk to them before. And when you talk to them the first time, I'll put up one more thing down. Selling is not just selling. We can put it into some aspects here. I know, all of you probably would say like this, is selling about relationship. Yes, for sure it is. None of you would put up that it's not about relationship. So, but the funny thing is, if we put it like this, sales have two aspects here. One aspect is that it's very transactional. Transactional mean that the important part very often gets to be the product because value is created from the product. If you leave it to the product alone, you will probably also get into a competition of the price. If you really want to com compete on product and price, it's a more rational competition. That doesn't mean there's no emotional part because there is. That's why uh, a lot of big brands are selling online because the brands have the emotional part. Uh, Hugo Boss, uh, Samsung, uh, Apple, whatever. But when you go more transactional, what you're speaking about is the product and the price. And if you go into this, it's sometimes better to be more online and be more digital. And honestly, then don't have too many salespeople. If you want to survive as the salespeople here, we have to understand that we can go more on what is called the relational part. And relational part is 
that now we are doing some different things here because now it's not just about the product and the price. Now it's also about how we create solution together. It's actually about the creation we do together. That means I want to be more I want to be more integrated in the conversation. I need to speak to the client. I need to understand what they want to do. That means the most important thing I have here is my communication skills. That means I must be able to control a conversation. I must be able to ask good questions. And I'll give you one example here. I just did an exercise and you can actually do it by yourself now. I said to, uh, to a group of people I trained this morning, I said to them, please write down three questions that you're gonna, gonna ask one of your colleagues about buying a car. Try to imagine that you're a car seller and here are three questions. They write down three questions, very structured. And these three questions, then they ask them to somebody else. And uh, what happened very often is three questions are now prepared. They're very structured. And these questions is a little methodically, meaning that they just put them up. First question is, would you like a black car? No. And then the second question is, I have two black cars. One is four door, one is two door. Which one do you want? I don't like a black car. You see the problem already is that you didn't listen to me. And what I made here is I made three questions that you already found out that you probably always fail after one or two questions. And that's unfortunately what happened from a lot of salespeople. They get so structured, but they don't get structured from conscious reasons. They get it because of habits. They get it because they're asking the same 10 questions every time. This morning, there was a financial advisor who contacted me. He contacted me and said, Mads, I can help you with a better loan. And then I said, but I don't want a better loan. And he said, yeah, but you can save interest. And I said, yeah, but I don't want to save interest. But you can also, and you know, He's not contacting me to understand me. He's contacting me with very structured questions without any kind of passion and involvement. He could have asked different questions, the same structured questions, but differently said, Matt, if you're gonna change a loan, what is the most important thing you want? Is it a lower rate, interest rate, or is it a lower installments? Or is it a longer time for payback? I, he could have asked me questions that involved me, but he asked me questions where he already thought that he knew the solution. And what's happening now is I'm building mistrust because he's asking me questions that I don't like and I don't see the, I don't see the, the credibility and reliability because he's not taking part of my situation. So what he already now losing is he losing to engage with me. And that's one of the biggest problems. So here, it's not about doing the structured questions. It is about doing the structured questions without dynamic ways of asking them. Because if you do the same question and you change them to be dynamic, I could actually ask, if you're gonna buy a car, would you then prefer a black car or a different color? Or if you want to buy a car, what, what option do you see if you buy a black car? And then I could say, oh, oh, black is not really my best color, but, and, and if there's no other option than a black car, what would you then prefer? That means I can, I can ask them differently and I can ask what people are saying here. I understand you don't like a black car, but if you cannot get anything else, what could make you buy a black car? That means I, I get to listen to this. And that is one of the biggest problems here that we don't create what we really should create we don't create uh, the, the right kind of atmosphere in the meeting. So talking about the two rational parts, we should go over here and create relationship. And please remember that a lot of you, you're creating relationship, what I call just by a single touch point. And then you'll lose it again because you're only there maybe for 30 minutes or 15 minutes, or you just have a phone call and then you're off again. So even when you're transactional here, if you want to sell simple things, just like the landscaping, because there's a lot of companies doing landscaping, if they still want to, to differentiate themselves, they need to be more engaging with me. And that means they need to practice how they communicate. And one of the, one of the things that you can do to learn to communicate is that you need, just like a football player, you need to have your basic skills, the passing, the, the work with the ball, you need to train that. So what you need to do here is, you need maybe just to practice few times a week. And what I normally say to people is, here is a glass of water. 
Please, for five minutes, interview me about this glass of water. And then what normally happens for those who are not skilled, and you can try this yourself. After this session, go out, pick something, and try if you can keep on a conversation for five minutes about a pen, about something. If you cannot do that, then your communication skills are lacking. But in that case, a lot of people are saying, Mads, uh, do you like a glass of water? No. And then they don't know what to say. But I can use a lot of communication. Yeah, I can ask a lot of I can ask a lot of questions to this glass of water. And then I can ask, Mads, if I was holding up this glass of water, what do you think about? And I think, oh, I think about being thirsty. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to drink than water? You see, I can immediately leave the glass of water and speak about, yeah, I would really like a, a Coke. That's one of the best things I can get. You like Coke, yeah. What do you see is the, what is the benefit of drinking Coca-Cola? Oh, that's because I really like, you know, the taste of the Coca-Cola. Who should you actually be together with drinking that Coca-Cola? What kind of social uh, uh, in, in, in interaction would you like? That means I come from the glass of water to the Coca-Cola, to the social interaction. And I can actually end up selling people a travel agency uh, product here. That means if you cannot communicate five minutes about starting something about a glass of water, speaking about what will actually happen if you don't have uh, water in your glass and uh, in which situation would you really prefer to have water instead of Coca-Cola? That means my basic communication skills must be excellent. And honestly, guys, I've seen it so many times, the basic communication skills of salespeople are lacking. They can just speak about the product and speaking about product goes here. And I'll give you a couple of examples a little later. So here we talk about the start of this, the words, agenda, summarize, writing, drawing, and referring. That means going back to what we talked about before. If I was to present a proposal, I would definitely start my meeting saying, okay, before I present the proposal, let's go back to the last meeting we had. Let's summarize. I heard from you that this and this and this were the most important things. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Anything changed? No. So just summarizing these three things were your most important criteria. Yes. Just to summarize the reason they were the most important. Can you put on some words? Yes, we can. That's because of, that's because of. What happened now is, I have reconnected to the brain. I summarized what I've heard them say. I summarized what they said to me last time. And what they will feel is, they will feel that I understood them, that I listened, that I actually was structured. And you see the problem for the landscaping guy. He's now gonna present a proposal for me and my wife. Maybe for him, it's a very easy job, but for us, it's a big decision. And he has no summarized, he has no, nothing he has written down so we can put no words into this that means he's already one or two nil behind so here please guys take it seriously you're coming here to waste not only your own time you're also stealing my time and if you don't understand that you're stealing my time then don't come here so summarize make agendas be efficient integrate me do your do your writing down and you can write whatever you want. If you have the best memory in the world, then just write something down that I feel that you're writing down. Because you see, I get a feeling that you're serious about this. So that's actually the first steps here. We talk about the rational parameters, uh, credibility and reliability. Let's talk a little about intimacy. Intimacy is, uh, is a great thing here because what actually, I'll go back here. What actually is very interesting is when you talk about intimacy and self orientation, credibility and reliability. When this was done by Green and Meister, their research about this trusted advisor, and you can read more about it. You can see great YouTube videos. You can read the book. If you haven't read the book, then you should do it. Uh, and what you can actually see is that the biggest asset in communication to build trust is not credibility and reliability. That's in Timothy, that is number one, and self-orientation. And what you can also see is that these has to be high, go high scores here, this one has to be low. Try to imagine on the scale one to nine, nine, I put this on a seven, I put this on a five, I put this on a five, then I'm 17, yes, but it's divided here. And if that one is five, then it's getting lower on the score because it's 17 divided by five. If I can lower this to four, 
I get a better score, 17 divided by four. That means I have to understand to work with getting these higher and getting this lower. But the most, when you take it then for, for each step, the biggest part is that this one and this one has by far the biggest impact. That means these are things I can learn. Actually, actually, if I was you, I would build, and I know my, my colleague Mark will now share the, the access to uh, a free template for playbook. To build a playbook, you can easily build, how do we do sales here? Because we want to build very easily without thinking. We want to build credibility and reliability. Then build a structure, build the way you're doing sales, build, build the way you're following up, build the emails you send after meeting. That's a good thing here. You've been in a meeting, summarize things, send an email, thanks for being there. But it's just building structure and you can put it in a playbook. And if you follow the link Mark put in the chat box, then you can have a free template for building this. But what is more interesting here is, the more important thing is, now we're gonna talk about intimacy. And intimacy is no longer, no longer structure and rational tools. What we talk about now is, we talk about emotional parts here. And here we talk about what kind of words I'm using with what kind of power. We talk about my nonverbal communication. And what I'll build you here is I'll build a small tool for you because to build intimacy, here is probably the most important tool that you can learn. It's called Iglo. Iglo is a tool, it's actually a four cylinder car to, for salespeople. Iglo is a connection between four steps and I'll show you what it is. Four steps of communication. And Iglo is, first of all, as a salesman, I need to give information. I need to give information to the people I meet. Of course, because if I never give any information, I cannot, I cannot actually program them and, 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 and make them go in a special direction. Going back to the question about the water, I put up the water and say, I have a lovely glass of water here. You just see the word, lovely. I have a fresh cold glass of water, positive words. I could also use another information here. All I got here is water. And you see the different part here. It's the same glass of water, but my information is in the one of them positive, in the other one, no, sorry. That means the other one is positive and one is negative. I have a good example here. Very often when I'm in a restaurant, I order a Coke. I said, I would like Coca-Cola. And then very often the waiter say to me, oh, I'm sorry, we only have Pepsi. <laughs> I have no option. Or he even said like this, oh, oh, I'm really sorry, could, could, would it be okay with a Pepsi? And very often I go back to them and say, what would you actually do if I said, no, I don't want a Pepsi? And then they stop and say, uh, then I can do nothing. No, but what you can do is, when I order a Coca-Cola, you just say, sure, you'll get a Pepsi. That's what we have, okay? And you can even sometimes say, sure, sure, Pepsi for you, is that okay? That means you say it with the enthusiasm, the engagement that you don't need to doubt it. That means if I feel that you're already not proud of your product, that means, oh, sorry, sir, we, we, we just have Pepsi. And some of you will see the same, no, 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 sorry, we, we, unfortunately we don't do that. That's not a good situation. Then instead of that, you can give me information where you believe in it, and then you ask me questions. And questions, why do I put up questions? Because Sorry to say, guys, salespeople think that the most important skill, skill with a sales guy is to get information. It is not. The most important thing a salespeople, the most important competence a salesperson can have is the capability of asking questions. Why? Because what happens in the brain when you get a question? I can just ask you. Now you can put in the chat box. What happens if you get a question from a person? What happened in your brain? What happened to your emotions? Just put in the chat box what actually is going on because that is going on in the brain of the customer when, when we ask questions, what you're putting up here. That means when you put a question here, somebody's saying, no, it doesn't go to rational. It was a good point to put up, but it's not the correct one. Uh, they need to give an answer, yes, or at least they need to start thinking. And when they start thinking, they're starting considering. And when they're starting considering, they are probably finding a solution. 
And when we get them to think, we can control the way they are thinking. That means I have here a little information, then I ask a question. And what is to think, the funny thing here is, a lot of you probably heard about open and closed questions. That's probably all that salespeople have learned, open and closed. Open and closed, yeah. That is, I can ask you to like black, or I can ask you what color you like. That is an open or closed ended question. But what I can also give is, I can give leading and neutral questions here, but that is formed by the information. And that means the information I give also actually have an impact on the question. Again, going back to the water, I can ask you very specifically, and it's very leading now, I can ask you, water is a fantastic thing, cold water, especially on a hot summer day. I don't know, how do you like uh, water? You see, I talk about the hot summer day, I talk about water, refreshing, because I put in the words, it was very leading. I could also put it more neutral saying, what do you think about water? That was an open question and it was more neutral because you can talk about bad things, good things, special situations. So if you want to be the expert for communication, you should be able to understand that we both have open-ended and close-ended questions, but also leading and neutral question, but that comes from the information that you dress your question with. That means the way you dress your question for the next step. And honestly, if you were, if you were working as a football coach or a football player, or you were a musician, you will be down to all details in the way you play the music or play the game. But how often do you actually think about what kind of question you're asking? What kind of information you put before the question? No, you don't because you do it on an autopilot and you think that they are all good. And they might be good, some of them, but that's why you have to practice. That's why you have to ex do exercises at home to, to practice your fundamental communication skills. And you see, I, don't, I, I just need now to put up the water, then you know what I'm talking about. And of course you need to do a couple of role plays. I had a very special situation the other day where I was working with these real estate agents and they have somebody that they send out to do the presentation of the buildings. And Normally you can say, how difficult is it to open a door and take somebody into an apartment or house? That's pretty, pretty easy, right? You are on time, you have the right key, but what we had to train is the way you appreciate people when they arrive, the way you start talking about the building, the way you start talking about the property, the apartment. That means we have to train what kind of information. Maybe you even ask a question. I'm really looking forward to show you this apartment. It's a great place here. Have you been here before? That means I tell it's a great apartment. I show my enthusiasm and I ask a question to involve you. That means I'm building trust. And when people say, no, no, we have not really been here. Okay, for me, it's a lot of times. One of the things I really love to come here is take a look at this park. Isn't it a nice place? That means I'm putting the attention to something good. And that is what I do here. I put them on what I call the green track. And the green track is, that I have to create positive thinking, positive emotions, and then actually helps me to create positive action. But what happened a lot of times is because we're not prepared, we end up in a deadlock. And I'll give you one example from that real estate agent. We end up with bad thought, bad emotion, and bad action. And one example here is I was there to see them. And one of the places it was really crowded. And the guy who should open the door for the apartment, he said like this, Welcome. I know it's a little difficult to find parking here, but I hope it wasn't. I hope it wasn't so unpractical for you. You see what happened? He asked a question about something negative. He directed their thoughts to the black track, and that's just because of wrong information and honestly not being prepared. We come back to that because it might be that when I go go on the green track, the the client might go to the black track because they experienced something bad. So in Timothy here is. I put in the right words with the right enthusiasm. I ask questions to have their opinion. And now we get to the point of the next step here in ECLO. We have information, questions, and listening. And just one quick question for the chat. What is the difference between listening and hearing? What is the difference between listening and hearing? Please put in the chat what you think is the difference. 
And then why you put it in the chat, what is the difference between, and somebody say understanding. It might be right, but I would really like to, um, to ask you more questions. And, and somebody put in active listening, but that's not the difference. Uh, maybe active is the difference here. What we should understand is hearing is a sense. Everything I'm saying today, you hear. But when I'm listening, I'm using the words you are using. That means I'm quoting them. I'm using them. I'm going deeper into trying to understand it. That is the difference here, that I really go deeper into this. And that's what called active listening. And active listening is that I go here, boom. And that means when I hear somebody saying, Mads, we would really like to have something to drink. Then I immediately say, I have cold water and I have other stuff. Would cold water be okay for you? That means I'm quoting, you want to drink, you want to drink now. And I'm quoting what you're saying. When you want to drink, what kind of drink do you want? Because the minute I quote words from you, quoting here in listening, it shows I listened, I heard you, I take you seriously, I want to understand you. So understanding here is not wrong, but it's not the difference. The difference is hearing is a sense where I hear everything. Listening is a skill that I take out and show I heard what you said. So what we do here is I need to practice my way of giving information, picking up words that you said. And even if I meet clients for the first meeting, I might even quote what they wrote to me or what they said to me in the telephone because the minute they feel I quote them, they actually really in a situation where they feel, wow, he tr he's trying to understand us. And that is actually the intention of building trust. And again, remember the quote from Warren Buffett, trust is just like the air we're breathing. We don't consider it as important when it's there, but if it was not, we feel it immediately. That is the same way with trust. The minute it's not there, we feel it. When it's there, it's just there. So here we have to work very consciously about building trust, being giving the right information in the right way, asking questions, involving people, listening to the answers, bringing it back to the conversation, using the words, framing what they want. And then we come to the last one, observing. And what is observing here? Observing is that you show that you are present. And remember, presence is something that is in the conscious part of the brain. It's just in the front here. And if you're too much on the autopilot, you don't observe. But if you observe, what you do is you observe that they are having a break. You observe the way they put the words and go back to the car again. If I said to you, uh, what kind of color do you want in when you choose your car? And people say, I certainly don't want a black car. Uh, other colors, not a black car. Then I hear not a black car, very hard. And then I could say, okay, I understand we're definitely not going with a black car. What kind of color do you then want? That means I heard what they said. I can hear it's important. I could even ask. I hear it's very important not to have a black car. Is there any specific reason for that? I'm curious. Curiosity is maybe the biggest, not being afraid of asking questions. Curiosity is maybe the biggest asset in the intimacy, being curious. Because if I only have a black car, I need to go into this one and ask them, I can hear you not for the black car. Any special reason? Yeah, I once had a black car. It was like this and this and this. Okay. So in case you can have a black car that is not like that, what then? That means I try to change it. Because if you don't ever try to change anything as a safeguard, you're just transactional. That is what I get. I call that an order taker. I don't need order takers. I need advices on, the, uh, on that part. So here we have this. That means I'm listening, I'm observing. And also here, 60% of our assumption of information happens from the brain. And that means 60% comes from my eyes into the brain. That means the eyes is the strongest sense we have. That means sometimes I even try to, I try to ask about something I see. If I see somebody doing like this, I ask them a question. Uh, what do you like from the menu? That's a good question. Yeah, I can see you feel there's a lot here. I can see the reaction in the face. Don't be afraid of asking questions about the behavior because you observe it. And when you show your observation, 
I can see you look a little curious now. Yeah, that's right, they said. You also look a little skeptical. Yeah, you do. That means they see that I have seen it. That is being transparent as well. That is being that I'm not afraid of addressing this. And this is the way you actually do this. For those of you who want to learn more, I can tell you already now that 28th of November, we do another live event. I'll come back to the topic, but we're definitely going to talk more about also the negotiation skills and how we negotiate with people and also what's going on in the brain. And then uh, for those of you who want to kick off 23 and is based in, in, in Dubai, I can tell you already now that we do a sales booster. Uh, a two-day workshop where you can participate as a sales manager, a marketing manager, two days to do the entire strategy on strategic, tactical, operational level, two days sales booster done in Dubai in 2023. Uh, and already now, for those of you listening today, there'll be an early bird price, uh, but you can participate and you'll go deeper into this. But also we have a live event coming up November 28th. But just to go back here, we now talked about in Timothy as the way we create the right emotion, the way we actually uh, repeat words they're using, that we show the attitude we want to create, that we are engaged. So now we talked about the more rational, emotional, and then talk about self-orientation. Self-orientation is a crazy thing because we have always learned that salespeople should show that they are there, self-confident, they're controlling. Yes, to a certain point. And you could put now in the chat, what chat, sorry, put in the chat, what sentence do you think is the one creating less self-orientation at all? There's two words, actually. Two words, actually, three words that can actually really minimize your self-orientation. And that's interesting because try to imagine what is it that all salespeople want the most? That is quick answers. I have all solutions. And the funny thing is, when you're building trust, then quick answers and fast solution are not building trust and actually demolish trust. The best and most powerful word you can use is, that's a really good question. I don't know. But I can hear it's important for you so I'll find out. If the sales guy sometimes has the courage to say, I really don't know exactly what you, how it should be. That means what is building, yes, if you want to build trust, then don't be afraid of saying you don't know. But we always learned that the sales guy should have any answer. Nothing is more wrong. The sales guy who actually says, wow, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I know the answer exactly, but let me know why is it important for you. That shows the, the customer just made an extreme good question. What will happen to them? More self-esteem. And I also tell, I'd like to find out is it, if it's important. That means if you put up these words about customer service, no, no, customer service, it doesn't help if it's not done in the right way. Customer satisfaction comes from doing this. Customer satisfaction is not a goal, so it's a goal, it's not the tool. The tool is to learn to be more, less self-oriented. That means also salespeople shouldn't have all the answers. Salespeople should have all the questions. Salespeople should speak less, ask more questions. And don't jump to fast conclusion. Very often you see salespeople, I had again one example here. Uh, I was trying to, to buy a car and then I said to the guy, I think it's too expensive. And then it's, instead of saying, that's fair, you're bringing up the price uh, and trying to examine what do we actually mean by too expensive? Then he just said one thing. He just said, yeah, but you have to remember it's not that old. You see, he's going directly with more information. He don't understand what I'm saying. And then I had a question for him saying, do you know if it's possible to do this? Can, can you actually put in uh, Android uh, uh, auto and in, in, in display? Can you put in that? And he said, very fast, he said, no, or he even said, one of the guys said, yes, yes. And then I said, do you know how you put it in? No, he said, you see what's happening? Trust is getting lower. If he'd said to me, Mats, I'm not really sure if it can be done, but I can hear from you, it's very important to have the navigation system, right? Then he would show, I take you seriously. I want to understand you. But what's happening for most sales people is they are so transactional. So it's a fast answer. It's a quick answer. It's a prompt answer. And what's happening now is, you're demolishing trust. 
So being more curious, more patient, asking more questions, and even being so humble that you say, I really don't know. So what we put up here is self-orientation, less fast answers, never have the last word, don't interrupt. So what you have to do is be slow, be patient, ask questions, be honest to say, wow, good question. I don't know for sure. Can you put a little more words on that? And that means being more disciplined in your communication. So what I'd like you to put up now, because we're soon coming to the end here, I'd like you to put in the chat box from today, where we've been speaking about the trust, trusted advisor here. We're talking about credibility. We're talking about the words we're using, the agenda, the structure, reliability, coming back to what we spoke about, uh, fulfilling your deadlines, in Timothy about the energy in the meeting, the enthusiasm, uh, the positive words instead of negative words, here down self-orientation, lowering your fast solutions, lowering the way you're always answering fast and you know all answers, maybe say, I don't know, or saying, wow, that's a good question. I really don't know, I'd like to find out. If you put up the words you heard today, what comes to your mind? Put in the chat, what's, what's the biggest learning for you today? And even if you're curious, what is the most important thing that you can look work with? Because we will give you more inf information and inspiration November 28th. We'll also put up this sales booster for you in January when you can participate on an early bed price. But I would like to put in the chat, if you're curious, what can I work with? And be more specific than just saying trust, reliability, and stability. Put it exactly. Is it, is it more questions? Can you ask deeper questions? I very often call it what I call, and some of you heard, Here's the mouse from my computer. I call it double clicking. And double clicking is saying, when you mention this, what do you actually mean? When you say you mean so, how could it happen? That means double click, double click, double click. Because you know it, if you open a browser, you double click, you go deeper and deeper. That's the same in a conversation. So exactly what somebody is saying here, being patient, not jump to conclusions. Maybe even let the client find the conclusion. And that could be by saying, I have three solutions here. Which one of them are you most happy with? That means I give them options. And that's actually demolishing uh, that we are mistrusting. That's building trust to give them options. Because the minute I get the feeling what is right, it's actually the opposite. One thing here that actually is also examined is very, very important is that sometimes when people is about to buy a solution, I have the big solution and the small solution. The most trustworthy salespeople is the one saying, Matt, I know there are two solutions. I've been listening to your situation. In your case, I would definitely go with the small solution. You can always change to the other one. I wouldn't go with the big one. Because what's happening here is we're not trying to sell the big solution. Somebody will say, yeah, but, but I still like the big one. That's okay. Then we can work with that. But they have the feeling that they get the option to choose. If you're always saying, yeah, you could go with the small one, but you should go with the big one. That's the right one. That's what everybody wants. That's what, then you're pushing them and they don't want to be pushed. So first of all, stop being, as somebody wrote here, stop being an autopilot, learn to have conversations just to be present, start building energy, positive words. Uh, don't try to control everything, be loose and be okay to accept that you don't have all answers. And what we're doing here is we're trying to connect with the brains. And I think what we do now is we end this session. The tool that you have to learn to do this is you have to learn that selling and communication is not just asking questions. It's about these four steps, just like a car. If one of those are broke, the car is not running. If it's a four cylinder car and it's only running on three of them, it's bad. So what I can actually recommend you is every week put up three sessions of five minutes where you just using these tools. I very often when I go to a meeting and I have a little extra time, I go into a shop, not to buy, just to start talking with some of the people in the shop. And then I go in and I said, well, I was actually looking at her, if you had a shirt in here, uh, what kind of shirt would you recommend me? And then they tell you, oh, yeah, we've just got some new one. Okay, why are they, these new ones, why are they so great? That means for five minutes, I'm just practicing my communication skills. Sorry to say, sales guy, if you're in a, if you're in a, in a shop here, you, you could sometimes see me and I'm trying. And the only thing I'm coming here is I'm trying to see if I can build rapport in five minutes with a new person. 
I sometimes even do it in a restaurant or cafe with somebody I don't know. And then I just ask them a question saying, I can see you're here as well. Uh, any specific reason that you're here? And then people start saying, no, I'm just uh, having a break before the next meeting. Oh, that's great. What kind of meeting are you having? There's no problem. I can just ask these questions. And the more I do it, the stronger I get. This was the final issue from here. And the, the final message is, don't take it for granted that you are an expert in communication. If you want to win sales, victory in sales is building trust. Building trust is something we have to learn. That's all from me. Have a fantastic day. See you on the number November 28th and maybe see you in Dubai in January for the Sales Booster 2023. Take care. Have a fantastic day out there.